Hello, everybody, and welcome again to our Glasgow Loves EU lockdown live streams. And this evening we're talking about services and an import that has been an important part of the single market. Um, and we'll be probably covering freedom of movement as well, two of the four corners of the single market. The government's been talking about goods a lot, but they've forgotten, as it seems, about services. So we're going to be talking tonight with Jane Hamilton, who's been directly affected by this. And we've also got Bernd helping on our technical bits. And um, Craig is going to be uh, monitoring social media. So please send in any comments or questions about this. And we'll, we'll try and ask Jane those questions. Um, so um, Jane, just to start off with, could you just define services? Because I don't know if everybody really fully understands what that is. Yeah, sure. I mean, we've we've got the sort of the big one of of uh, financial services and financial passporting, but services also comprises things like consulting, um, consulting with an IT engineering, um, you know, a software developer who would go on site at a customer in Europe, and we have things like the music industry, the creatives, ballerinas, fashion models. That's all part of the, the services, plus any technical crews in, in areas like lighting and just backstage engineering, that kind of thing. And I think you know, while the companies are exporting products within what has been the customs union, uh, we freelancers export ourselves. And I think the, this the whole topic of the freedom of movement and uh, the freedom and right to work within the single market, which is not just the European Union, but the 31 other countries, uh, is absolutely vital for us. And why particularly services, why, why would it be particularly different from just applying to a job in the EU well, country? If, you, if you're a services professional, you're going to work on like a short term project maybe six months, maybe a year. And um, your customers will usually need you fast. Uh, so unlike the, the processes for the permanent jobs, the agencies are the client, they want you to start within days, within a couple of weeks. And it would be absolutely impossible for us to wait for the work permit applications to go through. And um, they involve extra costs as well. And I think candidates who can't offer a fast start date uh, face rejection, which is why when I was seeing things like if you're not an EU citizen, don't apply for the project, um, unless you are in an extremely niche area and they can't find somebody and they will wait. And um, you think in the Corona days, remote work from home has become the norm, but before Corona, uh, remote working was not always the norm. Um, you might get customers where you would have four days on site and you could have an optional day at home around the weekend. Um, but the work, if you think of the security of certain customers or things like banking, they may want you to be in office. And I think we've seen these alarming restrictions being placed in uh, certain project adverts, even since 2018 for freelance contractors, uh, which were including this requirement to hold a passport of the Schengen country. So that automatically was disqualifying any British citizens from applying for it. And we were nowhere near the Brexit day at that point. Yeah, I know lots of difficulties, which we're going to touch on in, in a moment. But could you just tell us how you so I've forgot to say that Jane's actually an IT contractor and I'm just going to bring up a picture of what it's like <laughs> being an <laughs> IT contractor um, if you're able to work across well, so there we have can you see that that's a picture so that's Jane working in a, a on a banking project yeah it's and, in the top yeah and with it was it a local council um, yeah, it was the Town Council of Ro Rotterdam. That's me and my team in front of the scrum board. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the types of things you could do if you're contracting abroad. Um, so how did you get into to IT contracting? Well, I mean, I um, my initial background is foreign languages. 
So I did uh, Spanish and Portuguese at university. I had French from school and uh, I was thinking of becoming a lecturer and I did a PhD for that, but I decided I wanted to be in a more practical profession where I didn't have such pressure to write books. And I got to like IT. Uh, there were some courses on offer for Newcastle College, which is a really good place to, to study anything about software, whether or not you're an end user or a, a someone who wants to try programming. Well, they had um, an open day and I went along and I asked if I could do some more sort of um, software type courses. And one of the tutors there, who was a Geordie who had worked in Germany as a contractor and spoke German, said to me, you have foreign languages. Uh, why don't you try programming? Because it's another language. And then he said, and you've got nothing to lose because it's sponsored by the European Social Fund. It will cost you nothing. You've been a student yourself. I, thought, I can't lose. And I tried it and I liked it. But because I was serious about being more technical and, and, and actually developing software, I did a master's conversion degree at Newcastle University. And um, by that time, I'd also acquired Dutch and um, my classmates were applying. Everybody was chasing for the jobs at British Airways, or Sage, or trying to go to a big company, you know, like one of the consultancies in London. And they seemed to be struggling. And I applied in for, for companies that would put me also in Europe and use my languages. And I got nine job offers. And um, so I took, I took a job and I was with an Anglo-Dutch IT consultancy. And I got given the choice, London, Groningen or The Hague. And I went to The Hague. Mm. And of course, my Dutch improved. I could speak enough to do the job interview and I, I applied for them. But uh, I got put on Dutch speaking projects and it went on from there. I switched jobs. I went to work for KPN Telecom and I got some very challenging projects. And after a while, uh, KPN, had, they decided to start outsourcing. Uh, the, the jobs to a consultancy and then I went with that for a while and I come from a family of self-employed and business people so it's kind of in my blood I decided I would go freelance and I did that in 2005 and that meant I you know I was quite well known in Holland by that time and I could just sort of bounce around on different projects and I was getting repeat business from customers but you see what happens in the financial crisis uh, 2008, the banking sector started to sort of reduce the number of projects that we're putting out. So when you're thinking, hmm, what, what are you going to do as a business person when something like this happens? And I, at that point, got into telecom, a telecoms project, which was, it was great fun. And it was going to start for two months and it went on for 18 months. And, um, but somebody had told me at the time, you know, I could try Switzerland um, and there are English speaking projects in Switzerland, but someone said you'd have the edge if you learnt German. I thought, another language. Eventually I, I decided I would do it, I would learn German. And I was commuting to a customer and I was on the train a lot. So I enrolled at the Gotha Institute. I studied myself a bit to get my level up because German is has got similarities to Dutch. And I got up to, I think I, I joined the course at B12. And um, it went on from there. I would do my homework on the train and at the weekends, you know, going to, you know, just going to my customer, filling the time in. And so I got German, I got up to the B22 exam and then I did the C1 intensive. And then I had another language so I could sell myself in Switzerland and Germany. And that resulted in me going more international. And, uh, my technical skills went a little bit more niche towards things like integration and the mid tiers of projects and the back ends and enterprise service buses, that kind of thing, it's typically used in banking and transport. So that if you want those sorts of projects, it can mean you're going to switch countries for a new project. So you can't always say, right, I'm going to be in Holland all the time. I'll be in Germany all the time because your next project could be somewhere else. It could be in the UK. It could be, it could be anywhere. And um, so now my big problem is we're losing this freedom of movement to work in Europe without a permit. 
And if under the withdrawal agreement, as everybody's talking about the with the withdrawal agreement, um, if a British person has established themselves in a particular country within sort of the European economic area, they may stay in that country after Brexit. They may work in that country after Brexit. But what happens when the project comes up and it's in another country, not in the one you live in? So you still have that problem. So that's it's like there's no solution to it. Yeah. So so there's there's been some sort of provision in the withdrawal agreement for somebody who a UK person who's living like in Germany or something. Yeah. But if they go across borders, that's a problem. So if they're yeah. working in contracting or even yeah. just want to apply to a different job, and mm -hmm. they they're also hit with that, and so are, so are we for UK people wanting to work abroad. So so yeah. so that's obviously problems. So what are some of the issues that are involved then? Um, difficulties? Difficulties? Well, I mean, um, well, as I said, the, going forward, yeah, mm. going forward is um, the agencies are going to say, must be EU citizen to apply. And what it means is an, an employer or an agent in that country has to prove to the authorities that they've put adverts out all over the place. They've advertised in, the, in their own country, they've gone to the entire European economic area and they've not found this person that they're looking for to fill that project vacancy. Then they can look at the rest of the world. Um, so that basically for a lot of the, as I say, these projects that have a fast turnaround, it disqualifies you. And I think people have written about this in The Guardian already, um, that the, C, the British CVs are going to the bottom of the pile. Um, it's this, to this this thing of the, the, the withdrawal agreement just doesn't have this onward freedom of movement for other locations. Um, uh, there is a slight possibility somebody can use a, a Dutch registered self-employed solution, which is called an Einmansak, and that business owner would then be able to go off for three months somewhere else in Europe, but only for three months. So it's the 90 days out of the 180 that you have on a normal sort of a, a Schengen area. Um, but that would require somebody to be a resident of the Netherlands to have the self-employed registration. And if you wanted a Dutch BV, uh, you need 50% of that BV has to be under the control of somebody who's a Dutch resident. If you don't live in Holland, you can't necessarily go doing that. Um, What's a BV, sorry? A BV is like a limited, the slot of Enerschap in Dutch. Oh. It's like the limited uh, construction. Um, now, we, we're talking here about in, in Holland, you have this thing called the, the, the knowledge migrant, but you have to be on a certain salary level. Mm. You can't necessarily do that as a self-employed person. You need a payroller. And there's a very good one called Yellowstone that I've worked with for many years when I want to use payroll. And they are something called a um, recognized sponsor of work permits with the Dutch immigration authorities. So they can, if you fit a certain very high level criteria, they can try and get you the work permit thing via uh, the immigration service, but they have this special relationship to the immigration service as a sponsor. But people who don't hit that salary threshold, they can't do that. They'd be barred from it. And you've got things like the uh, the, Brit the the European blue card, and that doesn't work for freelancers unless it's at least a one year project and you have to be resident in that country to do it. Um, so it, it's not, there are ways and means, but it's not easy. It's a lot of red tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds a nightmare. And certainly that three months thing at the moment, I mean, you know, you've got people, we can go for three months, but we have to be back for another three months if we haven't done all these processes yeah. you're and talking that, about. And that business of the, the Schengen, the, that, the Schengen um, business sort of visa is a different thing to the fact that British people can come in into Europe uh, for the 90 days out of 180. That doesn't include working. That include, you could visit, you go, maybe go for a meeting somewhere and be in the country, but it's not a work permit, so you can't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the problem? Yeah. 
yeah, it's a nightmare. And um, oh, I was going to say something else there. It's gone right out my mind. I think we're, we're oh, talk, here. That, we are talking about um, talking about jobs and job applications and things, and that you're, you're known in a, a particular market. But I think one thing that's been missing from this whole discussion in the, the government is if you you're kind of known for one or two customers say you, you're working in you've worked in germany in banking and you've worked at the deutsche bank um indirectly agencies and, and other clients would come to you because your cv shows you've got german banking experience and so it, it can mean you you pull quite a bit of indirect mm -hmm. business yeah where you can hop on and that's also going to go out of the window <laughs> yeah i mean i was just that so that's what i was going to say last week we talked to somebody about data and that whole thing of like not out if uk is separate well you know yeah that could affect you as well and yeah so, so we would be third country nationals which is maybe some yeah. people might not know that term yet but we'll probably unfortunately come to know it so we would be treated in the eu countries just like somebody from anywhere else unless yeah. unless the british government managed to do some sort of further arrangements yeah um so i wonder if there's any any comments coming in on social media craig oh a minute mute <laughs> i think you're muted i think you're muted uh, yep yes yeah yeah no i'm i'm, I'm fine now um uh, yeah, there's no there's no comment at the moment, but um, uh, I can jump in with a question uh, close to my heart, if you like, about the musicians mm -hmm. and how they're affected. Um, so, so question for you, Jane, is I, I, my my son is is a musician and uh, uh, often has to go over to Europe uh, to play. Uh, he's 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 got. Uh, uh, a wee tour in in Spain in February. Uh, we're just uh, trying to get our heads around all the th all the things that he may have to do uh, in order to to do it. You know, once once the transition period ends. But uh, I just wondered if you could enlighten us at all as to the implications for musicians and performers. Uh, and anybody that you know has to go to Europe infrequently to do to do these these tours, you know they're they're not perhaps not working on a contract, you know, like you would be, but uh, you know they they still need that freedom of movement. So anyway, I appreciate your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not so much of an expert on the musician areas, um, but I do know the ISM, the Musicians Union, is following this quite closely. So the the first hurdle would be the you know the, the presence in in um, in Spain and is somebody allowed to exercise an economic activity there? Um, the requirement would also be that they need health health insurance of some sort because well they'll no longer be covered under that um, reciprocal healthcare agreement that we have with the the European health card. Um, yeah, and apart from that, it, it really, it depends on what's happening with the deal, which we don't know. <laughs> another another yeah, forgotten, forgotten area. Did Craig, did you said something about, about they might have to pay for every instrument? I think you said that previously at one point. Uh, yes, that's 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 right. Uh, 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 something the terminology is carnet or something. Carnet, like yeah. Mm -hmm. Carnet, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so apparently, you you need a carnet uh, uh, for every instrument, uh, and uh, apparently it lasts twelve months and then it's got to be renewed. Um, and it's it's about three hundred pounds per instrument, which would make it, you know, on its own. Never mind all the other issues about getting getting visas and all the rest of it, uh, would make it very uh, difficult for 
for uh, particularly up and coming bands. I mean, the established bands, uh, you know, the big artists, I think, would be okay, albeit, you know, it'll be difficult for them as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, it's difficult. Yeah. Another um, another big area, like, I mean, that's been part of Britain, isn't it? The music industry has been such an important thing. Yeah. Oh, well, so uh, just to move on just a wee bit, the also services sometimes when goods are sold there's services go alongside that do you, do you know anything yeah. about that um well, if you think uh, a classic example of this has been uh, rolls royce who they not only manufacture aircraft engines they offer a maintenance contract with those so they'll send engineers out on site to airlines to perform that and uh I think this it means that our serv own services industry is going to take a massive hit from that. So, yeah, it's a, one area where you'll get the, the world of manufacturing services mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this yeah. might affect like, the sale of goods as well, yeah, yeah. from Britain. Um, Could do. I know. So you, you did mention, like, obviously you've built up a huge client base and so many, many years of experience and you want to build on that. You don't want to just be leaving that and yeah yeah, yeah. so do yeah. you think do you think the uk it, as a whole loses out from this or is, is it really just individuals who are going to it's going to be a problem for individuals i mean i i think it's it is uh, it, it, partly the, if you think about it the government's never surveyed us so they don't know the extent of the problem and Yes, where where you're allowed to use your British Limited to administer a contract, of course the Treasury is going to miss out on big chunks of corporation tax. But it's not just about money. This whole thing of us going to Europe and Europeans coming here is about skills exchange. It can spark off innovation. Am I, am I learning something new over there? And we might gain really niche skills on a project somewhere in Europe, and then we deploy those skills onto our projects back in the UK when we're, we're doing that. Um, think of all the, the UK projects that depend on uh, European freelancers. And sorry, is, sorry, Jane, could you just repeat that last sentence? Sorry, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of, of British projects depend on European freelancers coming here. Mm -hmm. And you know where each of this closest market, and you've got even the, the government bodies up in Newcastle where, when they need skills, uh, one of their software suppliers will shop around in their office in Spain for it. So you've had Spanish developers helping the likes of HMRC and Northumbria Police with projects. Mm. Um, Polish staff working uh, for government projects in in further south in Durham um yeah yeah i know it, it's crazy yeah i know they, they'll need to sort it out won't they um yeah so what else um have you i mean have you seen evidence of of companies moving out there was a thing last week wasn't it about the lurpak butter at the weekend it's like oh lurpak can just come here and make the butter <laughs> <Yeah. or something. laughs> but they also say like, oh, well, if you could go base your company abroad if you're wanting to access the EU market. And I mean, have you seen evidence of movement of companies at all? Companies or, or people, I mean, for the, the whole Brexitist thing has been going on for a while. So people actually moving themselves to Europe to be established there before the transition ends. Um, you have a reduction of uh, the client base. And certainly if you look at financial services in London, look at all those banks that have then moved some operations to Frankfurt, Paris, Luxembourg and, and Holland. Um, and what what you do see as well is customers that might have wanted to do a project out of, say, London, have decided not to bother because of Brexit and just cancelled a whole project. And that project is then done in the European office. And that can mean that smaller firms don't survive. They've missed out on a, a project. And think of one example in my own network. Um, a, a foreign bank had decided it didn't want to do a project in the UK. And it cost a small customer 
£750,000, uh, which is for a small consultancy, that's a lot of money. So yes, you see people shutting down. I've seen one of my own clients shut down uh, because they did this, you know, consultancy Europe wide and they've kept that operations now to like, they made a software package themselves. So they're maintaining that and supporting it. But the rest of the business was shut down and all those very talented consultants of either one of them has his own limited and freelancers and then and another one has gone to work in a technology consultancy doing research uh, because there was so much uncertainty around Brexit. Mm -hmm. It's sad, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, we hope they're, the government are listening tonight. And yeah, I doubt it. Uh, they, <laughs> they've never, we've, you know, people like me and, and other freelancers, I've offered to my MP, Guy Opperman, who mm. doesn't do much. Uh, I've offered to, on multiple occasions to him that if anybody in the government had questions, I would chat to them. And no one's taken me up on it. The only people who've taken me up on this have been um, the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. uh, look, the Earl of Clancarty, who's very interested in this whole topic of mobility frameworks, has um, you know taken a, a really serious interest in that. And um, the freelancers and people out in my um, cross-border services work group, which has uh, been founded with people like uh, De Debbie Williams from Brexpats, British in Europe, and a lot of freelance freelance translators and things. Uh, you know, we really value their their interest in this. Mm -hmm. And there's been amendments debated, uh, Amendment 46, the Trade Bill, in the Lords in October. And um, it was Lord Fox and Baroness Spill and Lord Purvis of Tweed, as well as the Earl of Clancarty, were uh, putting forward the arguments for this mobility framework, not just for people like me, but as you say, the musicians, uh, the creatives, and young people who really want to be working in, in Europe. But the House of Commons, alas, I don't see evidence that they are going to rescue this. Yeah. So that so that they, did the House of Commons vote down that that amendment, or did it has it not gone back? Or I don't think it's gone back yet. Right. Um, oh well, we must look out for that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Craig, I think you said there's a comment come through. You you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so a question here. Uh, are you aware, Jane, of any issues about the recognition of qualifications or professional certification? Uh, uh, you know, for for, yeah. for people who want to acquire work in Europe or this is a recognition. Yeah. This is a, a massive area where I know a little bit about it. I think for graduates with a master's degree, it might be easier. You know, if we're in IT, then that experience on the on the projects and your degree certificate is important. But you do have other professions like legal services, um, aviation, that kind of thing, where the recognition of the qualifications is absolutely vital. Or they won't be able to work in Europe. Uh, there were even questions raised about whether or not British engineers would be qualified enough to serve and maintain European aircraft. And um, yeah, it's it's absolutely huge. It still needs to be put into the into the framework of the deal or whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nightmare, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and do you have any idea why why did they leave services out? Why was it? I think in in this sort of personal service area where you're going out to cut to customers, is it's this whole mantra of we're taking back control of our borders, and we'll stop freedom of movement for that was part of it. But the irony is they could always control uh, migration from Europe using Article Seven of the EU Citizens Directive, and even if. Uh, Boris Johnson turns around tomorrow and says, right, I, I, we're going to stay in the single market. They would be able to control that because under this legislation, anyone coming in from Europe had to prove they had a job or they had money. And if they couldn't prove that after three months, they had to leave. Um, 
so that's definitely part of it why why a sort of services base was left out of it um otherwise i i think it's some of it's quite complex and they don't always know how we work in europe do they know how a fashion model operates or a, a musician and they haven't probably haven't listened or spoken to these professionals enough um yeah yeah, yeah. i know again fashion another big area of the economy for britain yeah um uh-huh so um i know and also i guess there's it's complicated i think things like mutual recognition all requires um yeah. legal agreement i guess across across borders but yeah but we were already there <laughs> we already had the best deal <laughs> yeah yeah so um i'm just wondering it like in the around here at Glasgow base, I certainly know a lot of people who are working in a similar way to you. Um, do you think it's an issue that's particularly maybe from these sort of the northeast of England, north of England, maybe sort of slightly less well off areas of the UK? Yeah, I think I think for like the Geordies up here, uh, we've always been known as happy wanderers who would go somewhere where the work was. And um, if you think of the the areas economically deprived compared to some places then yeah i would be looking at alternatives when there's no work here where do you go if you go to london or you try to go to london you're three and a half hours on a train the fares are very expensive i've certainly noticed when i've bid on any contracts uh the agencies will go for people who are already based there and um so you've already got quite some competition for it, even though I have I do have a cousin in London and um, I found the agents would just ignore me. So that's when I would try Europe and Europe would bite. And yeah, and yet, so for, for very much for us up here, Europe is it's another project source, it's a very important one because anybody who's got languages and a lot of Geordies up here, we learn languages on purpose so we can go off and work somewhere else. Uh, we've got really good connections to Europe. We've got Newcastle Airport, Teesside Airport further down near Durham. And we've got the DFDS ferry over to Amsterdam. That's another gateway to Europe. And yeah. And then if you if you can combine if you've got your language skills, uh, that opens the door. Bingo, you you know you're in there. Um, if you think of the you know somewhere like germany it's really normal for people to go to other cities within the country and it's quite a large country so people coming from up here were just a variation on that you think how many years ago the the very famous tv series our feeders and pet when the the geordie bricklayers off they go to dusseldorf well that was re that's really happening i have a cousin who did that and he's a joiner and um, so back in the 80s and 90s, um, him working in Europe, it meant that he got house deposit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely happens. The plasterer that did um, this house here um, had been working in Germany. So, yeah. So, yeah. And, and young people, obviously, like working abroad. Well, again, that's more on the freedom of movement thing, but, you know, the chance to work in. Yeah summer seasons abroad and things so it's yeah yeah that's that's going to be really hard because i say you know um to get the knowledge migrant level of uh, you num you need an, a number of years of experience in an industry or you need a, a master's degree or something like that and not all the young people have a degree and being able to go off to europe and you work in things like hospitality um, it was quite recently there was a campaign save our hotel jobs, and um, the the graduates or uh, graduates or, or the young people that go off there and they will do a a winter season in France, and then they switch directly to Greece and go there for the summer season. Now that's then a typical example of cross border working and an onward freedom of movement. Uh, what are they going to do? It's gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was their sort of the, the step step on the career ladder. 
for them to get into the whole hotel industry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, a sad, sad yeah. future. Um, Craig, was there any more questions come in or? Uh, well, there was just a wee comment. Um, uh, the, the, somebody said, uh, I, I used to work as an IT freelancer in Europe. Uh, and he confirms what you said, that there's normally a requirement to be a, an EU national to do that. Um, so presumably, uh, once the transition ends, you won't be able to operate as a, a freelancer in Europe anymore or across different countries. No, I think the, the it, whole... It'll be very difficult. Yeah, it's difficult as well. The other huge challenge is um, they have the withdrawal agreement, but beyond that, each European country seems to have its own sort of terms and conditions of how you can operate as a freelancer. So we've got the Dutch skills migrant set up. Uh, we have in Germany, there are certain setups, but if you look at Berlin, there is a, a particular type of company set up and it's for creatives, but not necessarily for other businesses. Um, you might be you know, forced to work on a, a, a payroll basis. Uh, if you're looking at having the, the blue card, if you could get the blue card, but then you would need a project that would last for 12 months. So, and again, you've got those competitors from 31 other countries in front of you. Oh, well, so look, thrown up lots of issues tonight, Jane. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll look into that. And thanks for joining us this evening to tell us more about what it's been like working in services. And yeah, you're the welcome. The problems, the problems going on. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh.